your spirit will you know, move in our midst, God, that you will clear our minds and our hearts and our, our thought process, God, to attain the wisdom and the knowledge that we have in your word that you allow us to possess as we continue to study. Uh, God, as we look at the you know, single properties of who our God is, God, we look at the omnipresence and the omnipotence and the omniscience of our God, God, that we serve a, a great being, and God, that you have everything in the palm of your hand and are in control of all things, and God, we pray that we'll be reminded of that when things get difficult. But God, we ask that you'll be with our time here, Brother Keith, the ladies, as they lead us. God, as we tell, we study, uh, God, as I know, we'll lift uh, individuals' names who uh, will need our prayers and maybe comfort during this time. We ask that you'll be with them and help them in that regard. Pray that you go before us. Thank you for this new year, and continue to bless us as you see fit. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. It's good to see you, as Brother Keith said. Good evening to you. Glad you're here. And uh, here we are on our first service of the new year. And uh, I'm excited. I think this year is going to be a good year. Last year was a great year. And uh, I know the Lord's going to continue to bless and move in our midst. And so uh, we are thankful for that. Thank you for supporting this church and, and ministry in all aspects. And uh, the Lord will continue to do just that. Uh, last year, uh, from what I've seen so far, numbers-wise, is our best uh, across the board, from baptisms to salvations to new members to finances uh, to everything in between. So we're going to give the Lord the credit for that. And uh, we're thankful for your willingness and his faithfulness to be able to be a part of the service here and a part of his church here at Flowood. A couple of quick announcements just to remind you of a few things. Uh, we will start Wednesday night suppers next Wednesday. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet there in the foyer if you are interested in that. If you'll sign up, uh, that would help them in preparation. I know that Mr. Robert and the kitchen folks would appreciate that very much. That will start back uh, next Wednesday night. Uh, also, I want to make you aware of a few things. I know most of you are probably not going to write this down. Uh, so an email will go out soon. Our Israeli guy who lives in Ohio uh, will be here for a four-day seminar of the Old Testament, February the 18th through the 21st. It'll be Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night. That's February the 18th through the 21st. It'll be $30 a person. Uh, that's to basically help with getting him here and uh, travel expenses and those things. Uh, and and he's, he's brilliant. Uh, but those of you all who went to Israel can tell you that he knows his stuff. And so we're excited for him to be here. I would love for you to be here. Child care will be provided. And uh, we're excited for that. Also, one more date for information. You'll see this here in a few next few days. Revival. Uh, we have our revival lineup ready to go. The theme is promises this year. Uh, promise of hope, promise of love, promise of forgiveness, promise of life, and promise of heaven uh, will be the five subjects that our guys will be preaching on. That will be Sunday, March the 3rd through Wednesday, March the 6th. And uh, we're excited for that. Rick Blythe will be back. Fred Luter will be here. Brett Ladd will be here. Matt Powell will be here. My brother will finish it up. And a fellow by the name of Blake Goss will come in and lead worship. Uh, Blake is the one who led worship for the crusade at the amphitheater from South Carolina. We're going to fly him in uh, to be a part of, of that with us. He was fantastic. And uh, if you were there, you were able to see that. We're thankful for him and his ministry. But we'll send you some information on those things uh, in the upcoming days. And we're excited for those two uh, events, per se, that God will use those to do big things for his honor and for his glory. Does anyone else have any announcements that need to be made? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, an email went out today that we're missing some tablecloths, a few of the uh, green round ones, a couple of the long white ones. If you happen to take those home and forgot to bring those back, we'd appreciate you bringing them back. If you took them home and stole them from the church, I pray that the Lord will keep you up tonight and you bring them back. Okay? So, uh, no, I'm kidding. We are missing some tablecloths. If you'll bring it, we have some dishes. Uh, Y'all think I'm kidding, man. Y'all ain't never seen as much stuff that disappears from a church. But um, also, there's some dishes that were left there. Uh, there'll be a table in the small fellowship hall. If you've left a dish or maybe you brought something and forgot, if you'll go by and pick it up uh, Sunday in the small fellowship hall, then it will be moved to the big fellowship hall on Wednesdays. Uh, so if, if you have any of those things, please make sure you bring it back. We'd appreciate that as, uh, as they try to do the inventory of those things back there for the social team. Any other announcements? <clears throat> 
Okay, prayer requests. Let me go ahead and mention a couple uh, that I have to mention uh, what's going on here and, and some folks that I know need our prayer. Miss Jan Davidson uh, messaged me a little bit ago. Uh, his, her great nephew, Mr. Chris Davidson, uh, passed away from a pulmonary embolism yesterday. He was in his 40s. Uh, so if you'll be praying for the Davidson family. Uh, also, if you'll be praying for Tammy Munn, is con she's connected to Henry Deere somehow. He explained it to me, uh, but I, I don't recall, but she passed away. Uh, so if you'll be praying for, for that family. Uh, Lori Harvey, I see is here. An email went out earlier today. Uh, praying for Lori and, and the upcoming plan of what needs to be done for uh, her medical issues there. So I know that she would appreciate uh, your prayers moving forward for comfort and strength and guidance through the doctors and nurses. So I know there's going to be others, but I want to go ahead and give you those three that I had on my list. And so we'll start here on the right. Uh, we've got Sam ready to go, and uh, we'll start here with Don. Hang on just a second. <clears throat> A couple days before Christmas, we lost the uncle. Uh, we, he passed away, and it's my papa's brother, so he's my great uncle. Um, and then on Christmas Day, my my grandfather, my papa, he had to be rushed to the emergency room with 103 degree fever on Christmas Day, so that was unfortunate. Uh, he and my mama ended up with double uh, pneumonia, uh, so my papa was having a hard time dealing with losing his brother. Plus having to be rushed to the emergency room on Christmas Day, so I just uh, ask that y'all pray for the Morgan family. Morgan? Morgan. Got it. Uh, Donovan, I'm not going to say his last name because I mess it up every time, but uh, he mentioned uh, that over the last couple of weeks his family has been dealing with some uh, death and sickness. His uncle passed away. And then his grandfather had to be taken to the emergency room on Christmas Day, and he and uh, Donovan's grandmother now have double pneumonia. So it's the Morgan family. Uh, that's not his last name. I know how to pronounce Morgan. Uh, but if you'll be praying for the Morgan family, I know that Donovan would appreciate that uh, during this time and uh, for comfort uh, for, the, for his family and for his grandfather and his grandmother uh, to get to feeling better. Anybody else there on the right? <clears throat> I know an email went out on um, Vicki Long's, um, I think his son-in-law, uh, Kevin East, that passed away a couple of days ago. But Kevin and I were classmates also, so it was a shock to me to see that um, from first grade through, you know, graduation. So just remember that family. Continue sure. To remember them. Uh, Ms. Lisa Noel will mention the email that went out uh, a couple of days ago. Ms. Vicki Long's son-in-law, Mr. Kevin East, passed away. Uh, unexpectedly, a uh, classmate of Miss Lisa for many, many years. So if you continue to pray for that family, I know they'd appreciate that. Uh, Miss Nola, Sam. Nola. I have four. All right. My daughter went to Knoxville for, to stay with her, grand, her son, and she got sick on Thursday. And she's still just as sick as she was last Thursday as she is now. I, so it's Maria, if you'll keep her in your prayers. Uh, Ruby Burns is in the hospital. She fell and uh, fractured her AL1 vertebrae. Uh, they're not doing much for her at the moment. They're hoping to get her to where she can go to a rehab. Um, let's see. Uh, Flo Stewart is having problems. She's having heart problems. So I'd like for you to remember her. And I can't think of the fourth one now, so we we'll just have to move on. Okay. <laughs> it's all right. Ms. Nola Cole has a oh, few. Joyce Thornton. Who? Joyce Thornton. All right. She's uh, having some issues with her health and also with her walking. If you'll remember her. All right, Ms. Nola Cole mentioned her daughter, Maria, has been sick about a week now, not getting any better. So if you'll be praying for her. Ms. Ruby Burns is in the hospital. I actually saw her. Uh, she has a, a fra fractured vertebrae on her lower back and uh, in a lot of pain. So if you'll be praying for her. Ms. Flo Stewart uh, is having some heart issues. So if you'll be praying for her. Uh, Ms. Joyce Thornton uh, is having some health issues and some issues from a fall that she uh, took a couple of weeks back. Uh, and also Ms. Rose Blakeney. I saw her today. I forgot to mention her a second ago. Uh, she's currently in the Nichols Center in Madison and uh, seemed to be in better spirits, but uh, going to be there for a few weeks if you continue to pray uh, for Ms. Rose Blakeney and Mr. Kim. I know that I appreciate that. All right, how about the middle?
We have a praise. Last Wednesday, I asked for prayer for our daughter-in-law's father, Kurt Cunningham. He is doing better. I'm not saying he's good to go home yet, but he's much better than he was a week ago. Uh, also, for Henry, uh, if you remember, he, he lost his brother, Jewel, back, oh, what, two or three months ago? Well, within the last couple of days, Jewel's wife passed away. So their son has lost their father and their mother in less than six months' time. So uh, let's keep them in, in prayer. Also, I spoke with Toxie this afternoon, and he's, he's doing okay. Uh, he goes tomorrow to have the staples taken out. So, and they've been coming to his house doing PT, and he's hoping they'll send him to the PT up here uh, on Lakeland. But I guess we'll see about that. But he is doing okay. Got it. Uh, that Ter Tammy Munn must be the lady that Richard just mentioned. It's uh, Henry Deer's brother's wife uh, that passed away. That's not her? Okay. Henry Deer's brother's wife passed away too. Not sure if it's the same person. So just be. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. So pray for Henry's family. All right, there's multiple deaths in the family. I'll find that out. Uh, also, he had been asking for prayer for um, the sons, their sons. The father-in-law, Kurt Cunningham, had been in the hospital in Alabama. He seems to be doing a little bit better. So that's a praise there. The prayers are working. Continue to pray there. And Toxie Barnes, slowly recovering. Uh, goes tomorrow to have the staples removed. Uh, so continue to pray for Mr. Toxie and Ms. Rebecca. Go ahead. Uh, Bobby, let's remember the Jay Brantley family out of Brandon. He's uh, 56, I believe. He's been battling cancer for some time. He passed last night. He has an air conditioner business in Brandon. Just Jay Brantley. Uh, Ken Barfoot mentioned Jay Brantley. Uh, he passed away in, in Brandon, uh, 56 or so years old. So be praying for the Brantley family uh, during this time. No one else in the middle? All right, about the left side. Um, I took... Leah to the K clinic today for autism screening um, and they did give her an autism ruling um, which we kind of expected um, so she'll be starting ABA therapy soon if you'll just keep her in your prayers um, also Marley has to have some oral surgery tomorrow she has an abscess on her gum and they're gonna lance that and then pull her tooth um, and she's a ball of nerves so keep her in your prayers um, also I have a procedure coming up on the 15th if y'all will just keep me in your prayers please all right, Lindsay mentioned Leah uh, took her today for an autism test, and, and it did come back. Uh, that's the case. So be praying for us as we navigate that. Uh, also, Marley tomorrow is having an oral procedure done. Uh, Lindsay will be taking her uh, to that. Uh, so if you'll be praying for uh, Marley, uh, we would appreciate that. And then Lindsay's having a procedure done on the 15th of this month. Uh, so if you'll be praying that everything will go good there. So let's just get it all together in one month. That's how, that's how we operate in this family. So if, you'd appreciate, if we pray for us, we'd appreciate that very much. Go ahead, Ms. Joyce. Uh, Samantha's brother-in-law, Jonathan, should be having his heart transplant done tonight, so let's remember him. Ms. Joyce has been mentioned, Ms. Samantha Fleming, one of our members here, son and uh, brother. Uh, Jonathan was uh, scheduled to have a heart transplant, and uh, that will be taking place tonight, so if you'll be praying for him. Go ahead, Captain. I just want to thank everybody for the prayers for my mother. She's back home now. She's coming along, but she's still pretty weak and still needs the prayers. Sure. Captain, uh, Miss Anita Gamble, a uh, tough old bird there for sure. But she was not happy about being in the hospital when I saw her. And uh, it must run in the family about being hard-headed. But she's on the road to recovery. So if you continue to pray for Miss Anita, I know that uh, Captain Gamble would appreciate that. One of y'all, come on down here, Sam. Uh, Lynn Bishop, keep on coming. My five-month-old granddaughter, Summer, has COVID. Uh, Lynn Bishop her, mentioned her five-month-old granddaughter, Summer, has COVID. Uh, so if you'll be praying for a little Summer during this time, I know that Lynn would appreciate it. No. Anybody else? All right, let's pray, and I'll turn it back over to uh, Brother Keith. Lord, we come to you today, and uh, God, uh, it seems as if uh, when the list gets short, uh, one week, it seems to be longer next week. And God, we have a lot of folks that are just um, burdened. Uh, in pain, uh, struggling with different things. And so, God, we just ask that you will intervene in a way that you see fit. God, we ask that you will be with those that's lost loved ones in the passing 
of a family member that you'll comfort them and strengthen them. God, those who are dealing with health issues currently in the hospital or in, re in recovery uh, through rehab, that you'll strengthen them. God, we ask that you will just be with those who are at home and, uh, God, just uh, working their way back. We pray that you'll comfort them in a way that you see fit. And, and God, we lift up those that are maybe the beginning of a journey they wasn't expecting. So, God, we're asking for strength. We're asking for peace. Uh, God, we're asking for worry to be removed. And God, we're asking that you will fill their hearts and minds. And, God, let them know that your presence is there. And, that God, that you're good and you're faithful. And God, you know the needs of each person that was mentioned. Maybe there was some that was not mentioned. We ask that you will uh, use these situations for your glory. Uh, God, that we will use these situations to comfort others based on the scripture in Corinthians. And God, we ask that you'll just continue to guide, guard, and direct these folks. And God, we pray uh, that you'll touch them individually, uh, touch these fam families collectively. And uh, God, that you'll just continue to be with them in, in the only way that you can. We pray these things expecting you to respond. And God, we'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and glory for it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 Let's stand once again as we sing our next hymn. Let's sing, What a Day That Will Be. I study I have a, uh, a playlist playing on my computer and it's usually the 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 Gaithers and that type of genre music southern gospel and that song was one of the songs that that popped up uh, today singing by old George Johns you might know that name you might know who that is yeah it don't get no better than that uh, that's when that's when gospel music was really really good that's still good but you understand the principle there uh, boy don't get better than the cathedrals and if you don't like the cathedrals <clears throat> find another church but anyway we're going to continue looking at the idea of uh, of atheism and uh, we started last week and I was asking a minute ago do we have a handout no we don't have a handout uh, I'm going to combine uh, this week's and the, the next week's I won't be here next week I'm going to be preaching at a a youth event in Brookhaven. They have about 700 students who will be there. It's a big countywide event, so if you'll be praying for that, I'd appreciate that. I won't be here, but we'll pick it back up 
the following week, the 17th, but uh, no handout this evening, and uh, we're going to start getting into uh, the meat of this uh, tonight and when we get to the multiple property arguments of God. Uh, so hopefully you're here for the remainder. Uh, I know this is going to take us to at least March, okay, probably into April. Uh, so those of you who asked for atheism, I hope you're in, right? I hope you're in, and, uh, and here we go. So continue looking here, a recap from last week. We looked at a statement uh, by someone in the Canterbury that says this, that the being of God, that which no greater can be thought. This definition of God is consistent with the God of the Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians. Now, like I said last time, I'm going to say it again, I'm not saying that we serve the same God, okay? I'm not saying that Christians serve the same God as the Muslims. What I am saying is these three peoples, these three people groups, these three religions, Christianity, Jews, and Muslims, believe that there is one true God, right? They believe there's one supreme being out there. We believe that supreme being to be the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the, the Holy Spirit, whereas some of the others do not believe the same. So again, don't hear that as I said we serve the same God as the Muslims. All right, The idea of being a theist, of believing in one God, is carried throughout these individuals. Now, if atheism is true and we understand the idea of atheism, we don't have to wonder who God has revealed himself to because God is not existent. However, we know that atheism is some, some terrible theology and that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the Savior of the world and God the Father, Yahweh, is the ultimate God, the I Am, the, the one true King and King of kings and Lord of lords of the Old Testament and the New Testament. We also know that God the Father displays His glory in the heavens to show that in Psalm chapter 19 verse 1. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heaven declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. So we as Christians believe that we can walk outside, if you understand that scripture, we can look up and we can realize somebody far smarter, far greater, far more supreme created the heavens. We believe that person or that being to be God. We began last week by looking at that idea of the definition of God, and then I gave you uh, six categories of individuals and how they believe. The first was a theist, right? That's you and I. Uh, a theist is someone who believes in the existence of God or gods, specifically a creator of the universe. So we would consider ourselves theists. Uh, the second thing, the second term was atheist. Uh, atheist literally means, or atheism literally means without God. So if a theist believes there is a God, an atheist believes there is no God. So these folks do not think that there is any type of supreme being, and it cannot be divided in any particular way. Then we looked at the non-religious. These nuns, as I call them, N-O-N-E-S, for spelling purposes, may believe that God exists. They may believe that there is a supreme being, but they do not believe in any particular religion. They may not believe in our God. They may believe in this God or that God. So they have an idea of a God. They have an idea of a supreme being. They say they follow someone who is supreme, but they may not call that someone or something the God that we may call them as God. And then we looked at the new atheism. And we really looked at this in detail, if you recall. There's nothing really new about it. It's more toward the attitude of religion. Uh, that the attitude comes and goes. It's kind of like when your kid has an attitude. Maybe they wake up this morning and have an attitude, and then halfway through the day their attitude gets a little bit better, or your kid wakes up with an attitude and they go to bed with an attitude, right? So the attitude can kind of waver and can move, and that's what this idea carries as new atheism. And then finally, agnosticism. Uh, throughout the New Testament, Paul talks about a gnosis or Gnosticism, which is the, the Greek word of knowledge. And this is the position that a person cannot know if God exists. Uh, they have no way of knowing that the heavens declare His glory based on Psalm chapter 19. They have no way of knowing that God created you in your womb, and your mother's womb, before you were born. So they just say, you know what, since I don't know, I'm going to stay at arm's length from it. But this evening, before we get into the single property arguments of God, there's a question we've got to ask and we've got to answer that's really big in atheism, and it's simply, is God a contradiction? Is the idea or the person of God contradictory to anything and everything that you can believe and I can believe as a person and understanding what this means? Now, when you look at this idea, the only way to show that God could not possibly exist is to take an idea of who God is and find a contradiction. 
That we have to take the attributes of God and say, you know what, no, that's not possible, here's why. That we take the being of God and how he is created, how he thinks, we'll use that for lack of better terms, how he acts and say, you know what, that is contradictory to who he is. And so an atheist says something like this, if I can find a contradiction, kind of like I'll make and find a circle with a corner in it, then I can prove that this theist belief that God is who he says he is, is not true. If I can find one place in the scripture that he contradicts himself, then I can do that. Well, in order for that to be done, in order for us to understand, we have to have a definition of God. We have to have a definition that we say as Christians, this is what we believe and why we believe it. And we understand the argument is what what, what an atheist would say. As they're trying to disprove what you and I believe, we have to understand where they're coming from. And so one definition says it like this that I do personally like. It says, and I quote, when we say that God is a supreme being, when we say that he is the infinite creator, We mean that he is above all creatures, that he is self-existing, that he is infinitely perfect in mind, thought, and spirit, that he is the first and the last, and besides him there is no God. I think we would agree with that definition. That he is greater than all creatures, that he has time within himself, right? The concept of time is made by him, so it's within himself. And so we need to be able to see God and understand God in direct and indirect ways. Now, when we look at this idea, we can know what God is not. For example, God exists beyond space. We can't put God in a box. We try to put God in a box, but we can't put God in a box. We can't say that God's only in the U.S. of A., but he's not in China or Africa. Why is that? Because he is not made of matter. Matter is what is used to take up space. God is the one that defines matter. So he is all places at all times. We'll talk about that in just a minute. God is morally perfect. So we can't find a contradiction that he's going to sin because in him there is no wrong. There is no concept of time because he has no beginning and he has no end. And we can understand also that God is a perfect and we can familiarize ourselves with his perfection by looking at his grace, love, mercy, and justice all throughout the scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. We can say that God is perfect love because he possesses perfect knowledge and he has perfect knowledge because he possesses perfect love. And we can see that his goodness reigns supreme because that's who he is and that his power is infinite, that his justice is straight and so on and so forth. So you and I can say, well, I can debate who God is. I can say that God is this because of that. I can say he exists because of the heavens. I can say that he's working because he's transformed my life. I can say that he's consistent because he's never left me nor forsaken me. But the division that we have between Christianity and atheism, the belief in a God and the non-belief in a God, is how we can find a contradiction or is there a contradiction in the first place? The answer is no. The answer is there's no contradiction in the Scripture. But individuals try to find a contradiction in who God is. And so our response is immediately that we believe the Scripture is inerrant, right? That's one of our beliefs of the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, that we believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. We believe in God the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, right? That's your first couple of points of the BFM 2000, if you got that little booklet that the SBC sends out. And we understand that there is a great God, and there is a God who is perfect, and there is a God who's not going to waver. An atheist comes on the scene and says, well, there's single property arguments and multiple property arguments. Well, by definition, what is that? A single property argument claims that if God must have a certain property, okay, let's just say his love, that property is contradictory by its own nature, then if that property is contradictory, then the existence of God is contradictory, right? Kind of self-explanatory. The multi-property arguments claim that God must, that if God must have certain properties that conflict with one another, right? How can God be a loving God? Here it comes. And what? Send people to hell. 
Well, first of all, that's bad theology because God don't send anybody to hell. You send yourself to hell. And so well, how does God allow bad things to have good people? You know, bad things happen to good people. There's only one good person. His name was Jesus. So, again, bad theology. How come God doesn't accept everybody? God does accept everybody who professes him as Lord and Savior and believe that he died and rose again. And so we see the multi-property argument is if God really died for everybody, well, why didn't this person come to know Jesus? Well, the Bible tells us in Revelation 3, verse 20, we use this as an evangelistic verse all the time. I don't personally think it is, but he knocks on the door, right? And Because why? He wants to be invited in. He could kick the door in, let's make that clear, but he chooses not to do so because he wants you to invite him into your life to sip and dine with him based on what the, the King James says in Revelation chapter 3, the verse 20. And so the single property argument says if this is the attribute and I can find any contradiction, then there is no God. The multiple property argument says if this is an attribute and this is an attribute and there's a con conflict between the two, then that proves that God does not exist. Must of, much like if God is loving why is there a place called hell? You ever heard somebody ask that question? Why, why is there a place of eternal separation? Because God said and made it abundantly clear that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And if you don't do that, you will not be with me for all of eternity. So single property and multi-property arguments in the idea of atheism, which leads to that question. What are the single property arguments of God through the eyes of a Christian? How can we say that we know that our God reigns? And how can we take those same properties, there's three of them, I've already touched base on them. How can we say that our God reigns and an atheist says that there's a contradiction between the properties that I mentioned? The first is omniscience. The first is omniscience. We're going to look at the three O's. Everybody, most everybody knows the three O's when you study the Word of God. So let's begin by looking at the omniscience of God. Psalm 147, verse 4. He telleth the number of the stars, and he call them by their name. Verse 5. Great is our Lord, and of great power his understanding is infinite. First John chapter 3, verse 20. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. The definition of omniscience is that God is all-knowing and that we mean that God knows all true statements. And if God knows all true statements, then God does not accept anything that is false. And so when we say, if God is love, yet he sends someone to hell, that is a false statement. Because God is love and he desires for no one to go to hell. And so the omniscience of God, based on Psalm 147.4, 147.5, and 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, tells us that not only does he know the stars and call them by name, he knows how many hair are on your head. He knew you when you were in your mother's womb. He, he knows even more complex truths right down to the very number, location, every subatomic particle in the universe. There's not anything that our great God knows. And as a Christian, we believe that. As a Christian, we accept that. As an atheist, they want to rebuke that. Why? When we look at this idea, we get so an atheist gets so, so lost in the presence, the present. Uh, we believe that it is presently true that we're sitting here today on January the third at seven o four p.m. walking through the Word of God, right? We 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 believe that to be true. Why? Because you are experiencing it. An atheist may say, well, we don't know about tomorrow. A Christian is going to say, we don't know about tomorrow. That's true. But the God that we serve knows about tomorrow. Right? We're going to say, we don't. well, here's my plans for tomorrow. And if you look at my calendar, maybe some of your calendars, there's somewhere to be all the time. And, and good Lord willing, we're going to make those meetings. We're going to make those appointments. But, but God may have another plan. And, and God may say, that's not what we're going to do. And this is what's going to happen. It may catch us by surprise, but it doesn't doubt the omniscience of God that he knows what's going to happen. An atheist says, I want to be in control. I want to know for sure what I'm going to do or what I'm not going to do. I want to know without a doubt that I'm going to move a full steam ahead. You continue with the same idea. Some of these same individuals say, well, if God is all-knowing, then how does God know when we are afraid? How does God know when we 
or worry? How does God know if he has the inability to know imperfect emotions? Emotions, right? Doesn't that go against his omniscience? Doesn't that go against everything that we say? God knows how I feel when I am afraid, but God cannot simply be afraid because that condition would be meaningless, which means this. So many times these folks want to argue about things that don't matter, right? But we also have to understand that when you understand the deity of God and the divinity of God, you, you understand God in the fullness of man, God in the fullness of God coming as Jesus Christ, then we understand that he knows what we're going through. Think about the temptation of him in the wilderness with Satan. If you're so hungry, turn the stones to bread, right? And you know what Satan says? Sure he does. Then he says, Hey, if you're who you say you are, climb up here, jump down, float down. This is Bobby's version. Float down, and you're going to be perfectly okay, and everybody's going to say, hey, this is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And then the third time, he says, hey, you know what? Let's go on top up here, and I want you to look at all the kingdoms. I want you to look at all of this. Not only will I give you the kingdom, but I'm going to give you the glory of the kingdom. And what does Jesus say? Get thee behind me, Satan. It's time to go. Because Satan was trying to bring division between, this is good, God the Father and God the Son. And if Satan tries to bring division between God the Father and God the Son, guess what? Satan's going to try to bring division between God the Father and you. And doubt. That's where atheism comes in. Majority of the times that an atheist is birthed is because they've asked God to do something and God did not respond in the way that they see fit. God healed my mama. God calls them home. They don't see that as healing. They see that as God not answering the prayer. God, allow this to happen. Or don't allow this to happen. It happens or it doesn't happen. They don't see it in that regard. And so they now have a bitterness toward God. They don't just wake up in the morning, most of them. I've never met one of those, and I've never met one on the deathbed either. But I've never met one of those that woke up today and said, hey, you know what, I'm just not going to believe in a supreme being today. Most of them have a reason in their mind of why God doesn't exist. And so if we look at God being a perfect being who cannot suffer pain, who cannot suffer loss, or cannot suffer any diminishment, he can never be afraid. And so since the statement, God is afraid, is meaningless, right, in the eyes here, it can't be true. If it can't be true, it can't be known. And if it can't be known, then it can't contradict God's omniscience. That's why he's infinite. I would love to know how God thinks. I mean, wouldn't you? I mean, let's be honest. Lord, can you help me out in figuring out women, right? Lord, I saw something on Facebook today. It was so good. I almost shared it, but I figured I'd get slammed. Joe McKeever. Anybody know Joe McKeever? Joe McKeever's been in the ministry probably two times I've been alive, I think, based on, based on his age, and he's, he's fantastic. But he puts a statement on there that says this, the pastorate is the only job in the world that people who don't like you get mad when you don't visit them. What about that? I mean, that's, just, that's the preacher didn't call me. Well, you don't even like me. That's why. I didn't, no, that's not true at all. But the idea is this. God, why do people think that way? You know what I mean? Like, why do I, why do I think like this? Why am I a pessimist? Why am I an optimist? Why do I think the cup is half full? Why do I think it's half empty? Why do I do the things that I do? Why am I OCD? Why am I not OCD? But the idea is this. There are some things that aren't worth arguing over, and some of those things is this. If it doesn't neglect or negate that God is omniscient, there's no point in us arguing it. And these ideas here that I've just given you is not going to amount to a hill of beans when you re re refer that back to the Scripture. Omniscience, the second is omnipotence. Omnipotence. Om omnipotence means that God has infinite power, that He is the man, that He is the I Am, that He is the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and He is able to do anything possible that does not contradict His nature. Look at a couple of scriptures with me, Matthew 19, verse 26. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Ephesians chapter 1, 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? As an age old, if you ever study atheism, there's an age-old challenge that you will read at some point in your study that says or asks this question, can God make a stone so heavy that he cannot lift? 
You may say, I've never read it. Well, if you get an atheism, you're going to see a question similar to that. Can God create a stone that is so heavy that God cannot list, lift? What does that mean? God being omnipotent means that God has all power to do all things logically possible in the mindset of who God is. What we consider logic is not always logic in the eyes of God. The way we reason is not how God reasons. We reason with emotions, right? Well, they hurt me, I'm going to hurt them. They hurt my baby, I'm going to hurt my baby. They talk about me, I'm going to talk about them. I, I'm not going to worry about them. I'm supposed to be washing their feet. I'm going to throw stones at them, right? So we, 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 we are looking at this. We rationalize through emotions, right, most of the time. God doesn't do that. If God did it that way, he would zap all of us, and we wouldn't be here tonight if we're completely honest. God rationalizes by what? His truth, his power, his way of doing things. And he's always done it the same way way. And so just because God cannot do something that is logically impossible because that task is meaningless doesn't mean that God can't create a stone and God cannot pick up that stone. And so God cannot do those things in our mind because he's not God as an atheist, right? Well, he can't do this because, well, he's not able to heal this, my mama. He's not able to help my brother. He's not able to restore me or he's not able to restore my marriage so it shouldn't be uh, possible for him to be God if he's not able to do that it's not that he's not able it's that we should praise God for closed doors just as much as we should praise God for open doors right and that door closing may be God answering your prayer in a way that you don't see fit in a way that you don't understand one says it this way and I quote to sin is to fall short of a perfect action. Sin means missing the mark. Here's the idea of shooting a bow. To sin is to fall short of, of a perfect action. Hence, to be able to sin is to be able to fall short in action, which goes against omnipotence. Now, what does that mean? It means this. It can be said like this. God cannot do some things for the very reason that he is omnipotent. God can do anything that is doable in his mind, in his plan for your life. But since things like a square circle or a corner in a circle doesn't matter for the kingdom, doesn't bring him glory, an atheist uses that as a contradiction, God just says it's not worth it. And there are times you're going to have conversations with people who are going to ridicule you, hurt you, belittle you for your stance on Jesus Christ. And there has to come a time that you look at them and say, hey, it's not worth me arguing with. Why? Because nothing you're going to say is going to change them. The only thing that can change them is the power of the gospel, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that you don't share the gospel. That doesn't mean you don't try to witness to them, but that means this, that God can change that person's heart no matter how old they are. God can give them a new life no matter how mean they have been. God can save even the worst sinners. That's the power of God. The final is omnipresence. Omnipresence. These are three arguments that we use that God's God, right? He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's all places. The attribute of omnipresence means that God is fully present in every location in the universe at all times. How can we explain it? I cannot. I'm not smart enough. Maybe if you can, help me out. I can't explain how God is everywhere at all times. But I have faith that God is everywhere at all times. Look at a couple of scriptures, Job 34. For his eyes are upon the ways of man, he seeth all things. Colossians chapter 1, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Isaiah chapter 66, thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, where is the house that you build unto me, and where is the place of my rest? This does not mean that God is identical to everything in the universe. Yes, he's everywhere, but it doesn't mean he's identical. There is one God, and he's perfect. He cannot be identical to anything else because that contradicts his nature. What nature does that contradict? It contradicts that he's the I am, right? It contradicts that he was there at the beginning, right? In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. I personally believe that the entire trinity was there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Not everybody does, and as Adrian Rogers says, it's okay to be wrong. But the idea is he, he's always been there. 
And if there's a contradiction that he hasn't always been there or there's another God out there, there's a single property argument of his omnipresence that God is not who he says he is because he's identical to some other being out there. And because he's identical, there's a contradiction and atheism wins. That's not the case. That's not the case. He's there, but he's not identical. We don't see God as separate parts. We see God as three beings in one person, but we don't see God as a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit elsewhere. We see God as coming together as the Trinity, as the triune God of his infinite nature, of his infinite love, of his infinite being, that he is able to do everything and anything that he wants to do, and that he is able to be in every part of the universe at all times, no matter what. No matter what. The same God we're praying to move in Israel or Ukraine or Russia or China is the same God that we're asking to move here. The revival that Christians are praying for in China is the same God that we're praying to revival in the U.S. It's not that God's only working in America. That's sadly mistaken, if that's how you think. God's working at all places at all times. What does that mean? What does this message mean? What does... The single property arguments of God mean. It means this as a Christian, that our God, our God as a Christian is all-powerful, all-knowing, and ever-present. No scientist can disprove our God. No pharmaceutical company can disprove our God. No lawmaker can disprove our God. No non-believer can disprove our God. They can try, but just because they tried to disprove God, And in their mind they disprove God doesn't mean that God does not live. It means that that person is wrong. It means that we can sit here today that because he's all-powerful, because he's all-knowing, and because he's ever-present, that is what makes our God, God. And this should bring about encouragement for you and for me as Christians this evening that he knows everything that we're facing. He knows everything that we're going through. He knows everything that we are dealing with today. And the Bible says that we can be encouraged that he will walk alongside us even during the difficult times. So may you be encouraged. May you be encouraged as you serve a God who's all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful. I like our chances. I like our chances. Because why? Because he is the infinite creator. Everything else, little g, is finite, right? He is the one. The single property, arguments of God, omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence. Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you for the power of the gospel. And God, as we try to study day in and day out, God, I pray that it will be applied to our lives. God, that we will stand here and know that when we share the gospel, that we're sharing the gospel, the good news of somebody who is all-powerful, who is all-knowing, who is ever-present in times of trouble. God, who is guiding and directing in a way that you see fit. And God, may we stand firm with those that may not believe what we believe, but may we share the love of Christ in a way that you would share the love of Christ, and in a way that souls will be saved, lives will be changed, conviction will take place, and individuals will come to the saving knowledge of you. God, may we take this message this evening in the power of the word and and God realize that if everybody else is against us Romans 8 tells us that you're with us if everybody else goes against us God the word says if you be for us who can be against us God we need to understand the truth that we're serving a risen Savior a truth that everybody in here knows but we don't always live in that regard God we live moping around and sad and discouraged and upset about decisions and circumstances and situations God when in reality we got to press toward the future. God, what a day it's going to be when that new Jerusalem drops. But God, what a day it's going to be when that trumpet blows. Or God, maybe what a day it's going to be when we breathe our last breath on this side of heaven and we open our eyes and we see you in the fullness of your glory. God, man, what a promise that is. And God, I pray each person here today possesses that promise. We'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and glory. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.